Scary Mysteries Twisted Twos, Jeanette De Palma, and Max Headroom Intrusion. Tales of Hauntings, Murder, and Scary Mysteries. Every week, Twisted Twos dives into a pair of uniquely terrifying true stories that are worthy of a more in-depth look. For this week, we focus on a mysterious and strange death from New Jersey and an unusual and creepy hijacking of some TV stations. Get ready for Scary Mysteries Twisted Twos. Number 1. Jeanette De Palma Dealing with death is never straightforward. Everyone has their own way of dealing with tragedy. But when the circumstances surrounding a loved one's passing is bizarre, it makes it that much harder to get over. Such was the case with 16-year-old New Jersey native Jeanette De Palma. It was August 7, 1972, a clear Monday afternoon when Jeanette left home walking down Clearview Road in Springfield Township. The teen had told her mother she was going to a friend's house. As the day went on and dark settled in, her mother got worried because Jeanette had yet to call her to let her know where she was. Mom then made some calls and found out that her daughter never made it to her friend's home that afternoon. Her parents then called the Springfield Police Department and reported the teen missing. For weeks, authorities and family members desperately searched for the young teen but to no avail. Then on September 19th, a person was walking their dog when the pup came running back with a portion of a person's decomposed arm. Police checked the area and there they found Jeanette's body. It was placed on top of an altar-like rock formation dubbed by locals as the Devil's Teeth. When the body was found, many of the locals believed she might have been a victim of satanic worshippers and witchcraft. First responders said the body was found with a halo of stones surrounding her head. The presence of crosses and stones all over the area and the corpse was noted by at least one officer. The crime scene indicated some sort of foul play, but a big problem was that police couldn't determine how exactly the young girl died. They couldn't find any stab or bullet wounds. Since the body was so decomposed, it didn't help with the matter, but ultimately, coroners suspect that she was likely strangled to death. When officers investigated the murder, they initially pursued a tip surrounding a homeless man who once lived in the area. His name was Red, and many believed he could have been a potential suspect in the crime. Police found and interviewed him, but determined he didn't have anything to do with the murder. It was two weeks later when newspapers began reporting Jeanette may have been a victim of an occult sacrifice. You see, for a long time in that area, a lot of locals believed a coven of witches and satanic worshippers operated within the nearby Wachong Reservation. This rumor was so intense it caused a panic around New Jersey. Despite the ongoing rumor, leads to the case were scarce and the case then eventually went cold. When Weird New Jersey, a magazine, was looking into the De Palma case during the 90s, they realized that even years later, the locals and police officers were hesitant to talk about the case, and those who did agree to comment would only do so under anonymity. However, there were those who believed Jeanette may have been a victim of a serial killer instead of a cult. In 1974, two girls close to Jeanette's age went missing in Montvale, New Jersey. Their bodies were later found beaten, sexually assaulted, and then strangled before being dumped. Montvale is just a 45-minute drive away from where Jeanette was found. Although there's no concrete evidence the cases are related, it's still a possibility according to many internet sleuths. For decades now, the case of Jeanette De Palma still remains unsolved. Even more jarring is that in 1995, Hurricane Floyd went through the area and they lost several cold case records during that time, including Jeanette's. A book has been written about this case titled Death on the Devil's Teeth, The Strange Murder That Shocks Suburban New Jersey. If you're interested in learning more about the case, it makes for a very interesting read. Number 2. Max Headroom Intrusion It started out just like any other ordinary news broadcast, from WGN-TV in Chicago on November 22, 1987. Local sportscaster on Channel 9's 9 o'clock news, Dan Roan, was narrating the sports highlights when, at around 9.15 p.m., the television screens of those tuning in began to flicker and then cut to black. 
A few seconds later, the screen came back on, but instead of Dan's familiar face, people were treated to a seated figure that bounced around maniacally in front of them. The figure was wearing a rubbery mask shaped to look like Max Headroom. Max was a CGI-like figure that once starred on a television series and then became popular in commercials. As the static hissed in the background, everyone watching began to realize this was not a regular broadcast. The studio technicians watching at Channel 9 were dumbfounded even more so than the viewers. It took around 30 seconds, but finally they decided to switch the uplink frequencies in the familiar studio space with Roan appeared. Smiling at the camera, Roan famously said, Well, if you're wondering what's happened, so am I. The studio broadcast signal had been hijacked somehow, but who and how they did it, no one knew. Suspecting it had to be an inside job, the studio technicians immediately tried to look for a suspect within the building, but they couldn't find anyone. It seemed the intrusion was over, but Max Headroom and his hijacking of the airways was just getting started. Because at 11.15 p.m. that night, Channel 11 was showing an episode of Doctor Who when static suddenly came in. Scan lines appeared on the screen indicating it was some sort of VHS recording. Soon a voice came in. He's a frickin' nerd. I think I'm better than Chucky Swirsky, freaking liberal. Then more sentences and words were shouted out. On the screen, the familiar fake Max Headroom had appeared again. This individual continued to ramble on about different things. Unlike the initial broadcast, which lasted 30 seconds, this one went on for about a minute and a half. By the time WTTW station technicians looked into the hijacking, it was too late and the damage had been done. Many Chicago residents were upset, others annoyed or frightened, still others found the broadcast to be funny. Hours after, federal agents were in the area to investigate the strange hijacking. While there was no clear motive or even a culprit, the fact that it was a large-scale intrusion terrified many. Government officials, including the FCC, pledged to hunt down the culprits. However, years onward, the identity of the hijacker still remains unknown. And it wasn't for lack of trying either on the FBI's part. According to lead investigators, they tried to track down those responsible by studying the videos, printing images from it, hoping to identify the scene where it was shot. They managed to gather a potential lead, but they had no evidence, only a hunch, and the FCC head in the area during the time had hesitations about questioning potential suspects. Eventually, the investigation stalled and the case went cold. Today, the identity of the hacker remains unknown. No one knows exactly how it was done or why exactly. So there were two of the most mysterious and strange stories around. The world can be a crazy place and Twisted Twos is always sure to show you why. If you enjoyed this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday that we know you'll want to see. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.